All right. For any of these sorts of things, all right. Anytime I have an electric machine, there's basically, a, there's an energy conversion process that's happening. So analyzing the problem, like we looked at DC circuit model problems. We looked at the synchronous motor, or synchronous machine problem. There's a there's an electrical side and a mechanical side. And what the electrical side is doing depends on what the mechanical side is doing. They're, they're, they interact with each other, all right? So as I've shown this here, I'm showing electrical power is my input, mechanical power is my output, all right? Which direction have I set this up? Is this a motor or is this a generator? Based on the direction of the arrows here. There's a motor, right? I got electrical power going in. I got mechanical power going out, right? So the mechanical power is always torque times speed. Basically, what that what that refers to is is if you look back here, right, at, at what I showed you on the screen, you're talking about basically the power out at the shaft of this thing. So how much torque is made at the shaft? At at what speed is it spinning? And what that that value depends on what the actual machine is being asked to do. So we got to talk about that concept a little bit. All right. So the value of P electrical changes, right? If I'm talking about a DC motor, it's VA times IA is the electrical power. If it's a DC motor. And we've already talked about this, but with a DC motor, usually I, I hook it up to say a battery or a fixed voltage. Maybe it's an H bridge like we talked about. What controls the current in the DC motor? What controlled the current in the DC motor? This is a key component of any time you want to operate a machine. What makes more current go into the machine? More torque required, all right? So in other words, if I need more torque on this side, that leads to more current on this side, all right? Now, if I got a three-phase machine, all right, it's basically going to be that the P electrical will be three times whatever the line to neutral voltage is on one phase, times the current into that phase, times what? Power factor, right? So the cosine of what I say is the impedance angle phi sub z, all right? That's my power factor. So that's what it's going to be in the case. So it's real power in equals mechanical power out, all right? Now, in the case of this thing, typically there is some efficiency to a motor. For a large motor, I don't know what that one said, this one, this one horsepower motor is probably not particularly efficient. But if I get a large enough motor, usually 10 horsepower or more, I might see 95% efficiency. All right, so if I'm delivering 10 horsepower at the shaft, that means the input power would be one divided by 0.95 times that, right? So, so it's a little bit more power that goes in at the electrical terminal. Where would you be losing power in this thing? Why, why would this thing not be 100% efficient in a real... I can think of at least two reasons. One of them is friction, right? The fact that this guy is spinning, there's friction on the shaft and the bearings and things like that. There's also resistance inside the machine, all right? Currents have to flow inside of it. All right, so I just want to understand this, this relationship a little bit between electrical and mechanical um, situations. So I'm going to skip ahead here for a second and come back, all right? Here's here's an arrangement. All right, this is you know this isn't a real power or a real plant. If I go into a plant, I typically see these sorts of arrangements where everything looks like it's a mess, right? Um, what do I see here? Well, I've got a pump right here, and I've got a motor behind it. My guess is that motor, um, I don't know, it's probably on the order of ten or twenty horsepower back there. All right, that's typically the number that we're talking about is is the horsepower rating. Now, if you're, if you're choosing a motor, you're using a motor, typically what happens is a mechanical engineer is designing whatever the fluid system is. So there's a pump that requires X number of horsepower to be able to push its fluid through its system. As a result, the, the electrical engineer basically has to pick a motor that's going to produce enough horsepower to provide that. Okay. So here's the arrangement that we have. So um, you see this yellow box that I'm covering over here right there. What's, what's underneath that? What's underneath that yellow thing? Well, that's there's a coupling there. So if I look at this in the back here, I've got a motor. And up here, I've got a pump. And underneath this guy would be a coupling between the two of them. So some mechanical linkage between their shafts. All right. And what's going to happen is as, as you try to push whatever fluid this pump is pushing, 
there's going to be a mechanical torque that's going to try to slow this thing down. All right. And typically you got to run the pump at a particular speed to be able to produce a particular head pressure or whatever in the system. All right. So there's a close coupling. The, the amount of current that flows into that machine depends on what, what mechanical load is on this thing. Right. So in other words, you can't just look at the circuit in isolation. You, you need to know something about the mechanical side of it to know how it works. All right. So I'll give you an example here. So here's a, so what do we deal with typically? We deal with fans. We deal with pumps, we deal with pulleys, things like that, or we deal with air compressors or, or just compressors, okay? Uh, compressor, what does a compressor do? I guess I wrote it on this slide, all right? But if you've ever heard of a compressor, what is a compressor doing? Well, it's compressing, it's pressurizing some sort of a fluid, all right? If I have an air compressor, typical operation, if you go into most factories or whatever, they have an air compressor. What's, what, is, what does an air compressor do? It compresses air, but what, why would I need that? Yeah, for air guns and things like that. So oftentimes in a factory or whatever, you, you, need, you basically need some amount of pressure to hold valves open, or you might have a tool that, right, that where you're trying to adjust things um, like a torque wrench or something, right? Those are usually pressurized. And usually I need air at about 100 PSI. All right, so atmospheric pressure up to about 100 PSI. So typically in a system like that, what you have is nowadays, typically this thing right here, I have a screw right there. Number three, it says air elements. I have some, type, some sort of a screw that is connected to the shaft of a motor right, like that, number four. So this is the motor, all right? And this is the screw. What will happen is air will flow into this thing and, and essentially get pressurized as it as it moves through that screw, right? We can talk about the physics of how that works, all right? But effectively, what it, what you're doing is you're basically applying power into the motor to raise the pressure of the air using that screw, all right? And and the rest of this system system here basically is because that process compressing air makes heat, and so I got to remove the heat out of that system. So I got a bunch of other stuff going on in this picture that deals with sort of how you remove the heat from that thing, all right? But here's here's what I would see in the operation of it. All right, so what I'm showing here is over the course of a couple of minutes, the x or the y axis here is amps, all right, into the motor. All right, so what do I see here? Explain to me the current versus time. What is happening, do you think, as like right here versus these different periods? Looks like I've got some distinct different periods here. What do you think is happening in each of these cases? What do you think is happening here versus here? So this is this is a transient of some kind, right? Out here is basically now I'm in steady state, kind of sorta. What's happening here versus here? And the current, if I look at that carefully, uh, this is about 25-ish amps. And up here, I don't know, about 55 amps. What do you think is going on there? The mechanical torque when the air is being compressed. Basically, what I have is this in an air compressor, it will quote, quote unquote load and unload. So basically, if this valve opens here to let air in, it starts to compress. So, in other words, it, mechanical work is required. It's, it's pressurizing air, which is going to put more torque on the shaft and is effectively going to cause then more current to flow into the machine. If I close the valve and don't allow any air in, it's not going to pressurize anything. The current is going to drop down because there's less work that needs to be done. Okay, And so what I see is, is that the current sort of follows that. The voltage, on the other hand, at the terminals of the machine, what do I know about the voltage at the terminals of the machine? What should be true about that? The current's really what matters to me during normal operation, right? Does the voltage, what, what do I know about the voltage at the terminals of the motor? Should be constant, right? It fluctuates a little bit because of resistance in the lines and things like that, but essentially the voltage at the motor terminals is constant and the current is what changes to look at what the, as the load changes. So sometimes you'll see people in the real world, they'll be monitoring what they say. I see this often in, in monitoring systems. It says percent FLA, all right? What do you think FLA means? Full load amps, all right? And this guy probably had FLA written on there. 
All right. <clears throat> Turns out on a compressor, they often say RLA, which is running load amps. All right. I don't know why compressors do that differently, but they do. All right. What's going on here during that time? What's going on here? The current looks pretty high. It looks like it's at least 100 amps. It looks like it probably cut off on my measurement there. What do you think is happening? It's when it needs to get started. All right. That's what I would call this period here is what I sometimes call the inrush. <clears throat> right. So the current's very high during the quote unquote inrush time for it to get itself started. Now, why would it probably want more current then? Well, because it needs a lot of torque to get itself going. All right. So that basically it's all related to this relationship between the torque and the current. All right. All right, so if I look at the side of a machine, this is what I will typically see, right? This is sort of a typical nameplate here. So in this case, it tells me voltage is 230 slash 460. So this guy is basically a, a 480 volt motor. And it tells me the amp ratings here. Now, the reason it has two, I don't know, I actually should know this, but I, I've never seen a situation where somebody uses it at 230 volts. All right, I, I guess I... Heard tell that sometimes that happens on boats, um, but I, I don't know. I've never seen it in the real world here. Um, this guy is rated for 25 horsepower. All right. The other number that is particularly important on here, usually for me, is the RPM of it, 1750. All right. Why seven? So what does this mean? What this means basically is if the machine was delivering 25 horsepower at its shaft, all right, so there was the shaft is delivering 25 horsepower of mechanical work, all right, at 460 volts and 60 hertz. I would expect 28.4 amps to be going into each phase. All right, that would be the full load amps on this particular machine. Um, and it would be spinning at 1,750 RPM. That's an odd number, right? 1,750 RPM. Numbers that we've dealt with before in a 60 hertz, right? So in the synchronous machine, we said 60 hertz corresponds to 3,600 RPM, right? If I go half of that speed, it would be 1,800 RPM, right? That's close to 1,750, but not exactly 1,750, all right? And there's a relationship between this value, 1,800, and this value here, 1,750, which we need to investigate, okay? All right. So just to unpack this a little bit, all right, I just want to understand, again, this relationship that I would have between the mechanical side and the electrical side. So here's a DC motor. So we had this basic circuit model for the DC motor. All right, I apply a voltage VA and a current IA flows into it. All right, how do I figure out what IA is for this machine? How do I figure out that current IA? Yeah, so it's very simple, right? It's basically just a, it's, it's like a circuits one problem. VA minus K omega M divided by RA. All right. Sometimes people ask, why do I ignore the inductance in that thing? Circuit should have inductance, but it's a DC motor, right? What's the, does the inductance matter in a DC motor in steady state? In steady state, it does not. In transient, maybe it does. Right, but I know what's true about an inductor's impedance at DC. It's zero, right? So it doesn't really matter to me much in steady state. That's why I've left it out. All right. And in, in transient, it usually doesn't matter much either. All right. All right. So I've got that basic relationship. If I want to figure out the torque produced by the machine, what's the relationship between the torque and the current in the motor? Torque is equal to what times what for a DC motor? Well, so there's oh, oh, wait. oh I can, sorry, sorry. So what we said is there's a constant for this thing, right? Which we derived and you have it for the homework problems that you got. Some some constant that you're given times IA. So if IA goes up, torque goes up, right? And I call it T tau E because it's the electrical torque. It's the torque that the machine is making. All right. Now if I plug that in here, so my current is this, I get this relationship Km times Ia, so Km times Va over Ra minus 
k squared omega m over ra like that. What would that look like here? If I were to graph this, what would this look like? So what have I what have I shown here? Basically, I'm showing torque on the y-axis, speed on the x-axis. What would that look like if I graphed it? What was that? It's yeah, yeah, it's a line. It's gonna be linear. It's gonna go down, right? It's gonna be a linear relationship like that. Right, where this basically is what I call the no load condition here. This would be my maximum torque. So this is zero speed. Yeah, as we call the stall torque. Usually stall torque is a little bit lower than that because I can't usually get it all the way down there. All right, and then this would be basically my no load condition. This is idealized. This is a machine with no losses, right? So if I think about what's going on, what's got to be true about this machine in steady state? In steady state, the electrical torque and the mechanical torque have to be equal to each other, right? So if he's moving at a constant speed, that has to be true. So if I'm, what we can do is sort of think about this as, if this is the mechanical torque, where the mechanical torque intersects this curve is where this thing operates. If I increase the mechanical torque to here, Let's so say this is my, this is condition one, and this is condition two. So in the example I gave in class, what did I do? I took, I took a motor and I grabbed the shaft of it, right? If I grab the shaft of it, basically, if I tighten my fingers on the shaft, basically that's increasing the mechanical torque. So what I, what I do is I basically look at what I call the torque speed curve. And the torque speed curve tells me essentially where the intersection point is going to be. Where is that operating point? And I need that operating point to feed back into the analysis on the electrical side, right? So, because the electrical side tells me, so basically it operates like this. For a given mechanical torque, there's a given operating speed that I have. Knowing that operating speed, I plug that back into here to figure out what's the current have to be, okay? So that's the, sort of the basic sort of form of operation of, of these things is there is this sort of operating characteristic usually that shows how the torque and speed relate to each other. I take that information and I plug that back in on the electrical side to figure out what's going to happen. All right. So if I look at an induction motor, we're going to figure this out, but I'm going to start here for a second. Usually an induction motor has a curve that looks like this. So it, it shows a couple of different things. In this case, it's showing the current and it's showing the torque. All right. So the torque of the machine is this black curve that is indicated by that arrow, the current is that guy, all right? Now, one thing I wanna point out here real quick, the way this guy is, is written out, again, this is typical of how these things are reported. What it's showing here on the y-axis, it says per unit torque, PU torque, all right? And then down here, it shows synchronous speed, all right? What this thing is telling me is, this is what the torque looks like in the motor, as a function of speed. So synchronous speed, I haven't really defined that term, but synchronous speed is essentially here, this is the fastest that this thing can actually move, all right? This is the fastest speed that this guy can actually run at at 60 hertz, all right? So the fastest, if he runs at 100% of that synchronous speed, he's running at as fast as possible speed he can. At that point, how much torque does he make? Zero, all right? Now, here at one per unit torque, that's where he's rated to operate, all right? Where he's rated to operate somewhere like, like that, all right? So at one per unit torque, that's his rated torque. How much is the speed different from, a, from the maximum? Here's 100%. Not much. Not much, right? Not much, right? So we're going to talk about why that is, but that's why this guy, what do you think his maximum speed is? 1,800 RPM. And at full load, he's at 1,750. He's only dropped 50 RPM away from there. Sometimes induction motors are called constant speed motors, all right, because they don't change much perceptibly, all right? To go from no load to full load is a minimal change in speed. Now, for a small motor, a junk motor like this one, one horsepower, it's probably at like 1,700, all right? 
Um, but for a large motor, if we're talking something serious, it may only be in some cases, I've seen it be as low as like 1780 for an 1800 RPM, right? So, so when we refer to that, I'm gonna define that more. I refer to that as how much it slips, all right? Uh, how much it basically falls behind um, what its full speed rating is. All right, so I wanna understand more about how this guy works. But before I do, I want to make a make a little model for it. Okay, so this is the way I can think of it. All right, so I've got I wrote A S A R B S B R and C S C R. All right, what's S and what's R? Stator and rotor. Okay, so we think of it as having a three phase stator and a three phase rotor. Now I showed you the rotor. All right, to define that thing as three phase um, seems a little bit overdone, right? It's basically a set of bars that run through the iron, and then there's these caps on either side. All right, so I got a short circuit going on here. I can model that as three phase, all right? So our basic operation with this thing is I say that the windings are sinusoidally distributed. All right, what does that mean? Well, that meant that essentially what I'm showing here, this is where the maximum density of the windings would be on any phase, and it would decrease as you went around in either direction. All right. The AC voltage applied to the machine is three phase and constant. And then the currents that flow into the stator are three phase. All right. And they depend, the magnitude depends on the load. We've been clear about that. So the rotor windings are short circuited. So we basically say that the voltage applied to A phase, B phase, and C phase on the rotor is zero. All right. There's nothing applied there. All right, so that's our basic sort of starting point for this thing. So here's what our rotor looks like. So that's actually what the rotor cage would look like, right? If I didn't have the iron sheets in there. All right, so you can see that it's this cage. And these, again, these are aluminum bars. Bigger machine would probably be a copper bar. All right, but, but in um, smaller machines, typically aluminum because it's easier to, to make it that way. All right, um, this is compared to the synchronous machine. Synchronous machine, I had to put a current into it. So you had to have those slip rings on side on this thing to get the current into it. Induction motor, I got no way to do that. So somehow I have to be able to make that happen. All right. So I want to talk real quick. I, I mentioned this before. We didn't go through it too carefully, but I, I want to talk about what happens inside the motor. All right. Because it's really important to understand the induction machine, at least to understand it. What I said is if I have a three-phase set of currents in the stator and I sinusoidally wind the windings, what I get is a magnetic field that looks like that. All right, so what is that? What did I just write there? B of theta. So the magnetic field in the air gap as a function of theta is that formula. So, all right, let's unpack this thing here. So what is this? It looks like some constant times cosine theta minus omega t, all right? And this is this basically comes from the fact that the currents, remember, like IAS would be IA cosine, let's say omega t like that, all right? And then B and C would be the same except shifted by 120 degrees. This is a constant here. So mu naught, we know what that is. NS is the number of turns. G is, is what? What do you think G is? What do you think G would be? The air gap width, which would be nowhere near as exaggerated as what I've shown in this picture here. What I'm showing here, here's a stator, here's a rotor. And what I'm showing is, here's my winding location. This would be A phase, B phase here, C phase here. What am I showing with these arrows there? Well, I'm showing what the magnetic field looks like, all right? The magnetic field in the air gap is a function of theta. Depends where I am angularly. So this is zero degrees here. This is 90 degrees up here. This would be two, 180 degrees here. This would be 270 degrees here. All right. What I'm showing is that the field in the air gap, what, how it's distributed depends on time because the currents I put in were, were AC currents. What I've shown here is what happens at t equal to zero, right? At t equal to zero, this, this thing becomes b of theta is equal to whatever the maximum value is, which is, depends on these constants here, times the cosine of theta. 
All right. So if I if I plotted that versus theta, it would look like that. Right? That's co that's whatever this function is here. That's that's how I draw that sort of sort of drawn out. What I can see is that if this is theta equal to zero, that means the field strength is strongest here in the positive radial direction, and then getting smaller as I go toward 90 degrees, and then changing direction as I pass through 90 degrees getting stronger again in the opposite direction as I get to 180, and then basically zeroing out at 270, and then building again as I go from 270 to 360. All right, now, what would happen as T advances? Let's say, let's say T advances a quarter of a period. So at a quarter of a period, omega T is equal to what? What's a quarter of a period mean? One fourth of a period. One fourth of the period is how many degrees? How many degrees are in a period? You're not used to thinking of it that way. You can think in terms of time. How many how many degrees in a period? 360. So a quarter of that's what? 90. So if I go a quarter of a period, meaning a quarter of an electrical cycle, this is a little bit more than that. All right. This I don't know. That's maybe um, a little bit past that. This is more like um, omega t equal to about 100 degrees. What's happened to the magnetic field? Well, it moved. The strongest point was over here. Now it's over here, right? So basically, I, you know, at this particular case, what I have is whatever the maximum value is times cosine of theta minus 100 degrees. That's what this is showing right here, those field lines. So what I want to do here real quick, I got a little... I want to watch this here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So this is what this would look like as time advances here. All right. This was in the synchronous machine. All right. I wanted to be careful. So real quick, I want to talk about the synchronous machine. I had a field winding on this thing. All right, and this guy should speed up after he goes through a couple of rotations. But basically, what what do I see is happening here? The key thing is those arrows, not not these two lines that are kind of shown. Those arrows, that's the field created by the stator. What do I see about the rotor? The field created by the stator is that those little, those arrows are moving not because the rotor is moving but they're moving because the field created by those three phase currents on the stator is moving, right? The, the magnetic field rotates around. If I look at the, the, uh, the rotor, it's moving at the same speed. That's why I call it a synchronous machine because the rotor field and the stator field move at the same speed, all right? They move synchronous to each other. They have to do that in order to create a smooth torque. You think about it, the way I think, the way I like to think about torque sometimes is, if I think about the field current, the field current sitting at a particular point created by the, the rotor or by the stator field, right? So I can think of this as I cross B and there would be a force on that thing. And, and where, the, where the field winding is would move itself relative to the stator field. That's when you're, when you're doing your homework and you're looking at that value of delta, it's basically talking about how the rotor field and stator field align each other relative to each other. All right, now, in a synchronous machine, they have to move at the same speed. In an induction motor, I don't put currents into the rotor. All right. So I must induce them. So I want to look now. If I have a three phase set of windings, I get the same field. I'm going to run this guy now. I think my, man, my arrows get smaller here. Okay. And he's moving slower, but he's moving. All right, so watch the watch the arrows sort of spinning there. Now, place yourself on the rotor for a second, right? So imagine that you were sitting on the rotor. What do you notice in this particular case? Is the rotor moving? So if you look, if you look at the O and the X on there, the, the O and the X on the rotor is sitting stationary. All right. The field that's shown moving around, that's coming from the stator current. If you were sitting on the rotor, 
what would be happening right now? So just imagine, so that O and that X, X basically there are two, are two sides of the coil. So imagine a coil that was like this folder, right? That would basically be sitting on the rotor and it's basically just, you know, imagine a wire around the outside edge of it. If you were sitting on that rotor looking up, what, what's happening passing through that rotor as time advances? As time advances, what has to be happening here inside the rotor? Looking up, I have a time bearing magnetic field passing through that thing, right? If I have, so, in other words, passing through this, the rotor is a time bearing magnetic field because as, as that stator spins, or that field created by the stator spins and the rotor is stationary, you have a you have a time varying magnetic field passing through that coil. That's going to induce a voltage, which is going to make a current, right? If I have a current sitting in a magnetic field, F equals I cross B, what's going to happen to that rotor? I'm going to induce a current in it, and then there's going to be a torque exerted on that current to make it speed up. All right. Now, once what do we say? If this guy got up to its full speed, I showed this before. If I get to my full speed, all right? If I get to my full speed, that's here, all right? How much torque am I getting at that full speed? Zero, okay? So how could that be? Once this thing gets all the way up to full speed, let's try this for a second. Doesn't have a clean way to end that thing. Yeah. Just do that. I wonder if it's not to do with this. Let's run this guy again. Okay. All right. Now I'm moving the rotor at the same speed as that field. Now, if you're sitting on the rotor looking up, is there a time varying magnetic field that's going to be passing through the rotor now? No, there's not. So how much current is going to be? None. So how much torque will be exerted on that thing? None. All right? No torque is happening at this location. Now, if I wanted it to, so, so this would be, if I, if I get the motor started, there'll be no current in there. So it'd be sitting there stationary. I'll induce a current in there. It'll that there'll be a force induced on that current and it'll move, right? It'll accelerate. If there's no load on the machine, it's basically going to accelerate up to this speed. Why did I call it synchronous speed? Because essentially the rotor is now moving synchronous to the field that the stator is producing. All right. So the two of those are moving synchronous to each other. Now, let's say I move, let's say I grab the shaft of the machine. All right. So let's say I grab the shaft. Uh, if I were to grab the shaft of the machine, what do we know? What's the relationship in the motor? What's Newton's second law? Well, it's J d omega m by dt, right? Is equal to tau electrical minus tau mechanical, right? <clears throat> so in steady state, what is supposed to be true about these two things, tau electrical and tau mechanical? They should be equal to each other. If I'm in steady state, it means a constant speed. All right, so if I got all the way up to, so there was no load on the machine, and then I suddenly grabbed the shaft, right? I would apply some mechanical torque to it, all right? So what would you expect if the mechanical torque initially goes up? So if tau m goes up, what's true about tau e minus tau m? It will be negative. So what would you expect the speed to do? The speed would drop, all right? As it drops, the torque electrical is going to increase, meaning more current is going to go into the machine. Eventually, those two things are going to be equal to each other again, and it's going to stop slowing down, all right? <clears throat> but let's see if we can understand from this picture, if it slows down a little bit. So it's moving, but it slows down. Let me, turn, let me make that speed point. Uh, Right. So now they're both moving. Except watch, watch the rotor 
relative to the stator. Hard to see this, right? But if you watch the rotor there, it is moving, as is the stator field, but they're clearly moving. I hope you can see that. They're moving at different speeds, right? The rotor is moving a little bit slower, all right? So now if I was on the stator looking up, or sorry, on the rotor looking up, would I see a time-varying magnetic field here? I would, right? So there would be a voltage induced and a current induced. What would the frequency be of the current that's induced? What do you think the frequency of the current would be that's induced in that case? The difference, right? Yeah, so, so if the stator field is omega, this basically would be 2 pi 60, all right? And the thing is moving at a mechanical speed omega m. I call that speed omega r. So the rotor electrical frequency is the difference between these two. <clears throat> if I, in general, all right, if I had essentially a, a p-pole machine, all right, we would relate that to the number of poles in the machine, which we'll do on, on Wednesday. The important thing is if I think about how to model this thing, right? What device have we learned that this thing is a lot like? Right? So in terms of the way this guy operates, right? This guy is a lot like a what that we learned about in the first half of the semester. I'm inducing a current over here to get it to do anything. So what's this look like? It's like a transformer, right? Essentially, there's a transformer happening here where I am inducing a current in a secondary. The secondary, basically, for me, is over here on the rotor. I'm inducing a current over there. It's great. This thing's really rugged because I don't have to actually put a current into it. That's where a DC motor or a synchronous machine breaks down is having to put a current into that thing. All right. In this case, I don't have to do that. It induces it itself, and that's why we call it an induction motor. Okay. All right. So we're going to make a model for it on, on Wednesday. But... Um,